Okay. Um, then I say welcome to J Focus and welcome to my talk on domain storytelling and good morning, everybody. I'm very happy that we have the real cinema edition now again, not the home cinema Netflix edition anymore. It's awesome to see so many people here. So um, this talk is about storytelling. That's why I want to start with a little story. So please gather with me around the campfire here, the virtual campfire, and imagine how our ancestors, the cavemen, did the same. So let's imagine a tribe of cavemen, um, <coughs> of ancient men, sitting in their cave around the campfire in the midst of winter. It's cold, the wind is howling outside, the snow is snowing. And it's warm and comfortable inside, but it's also a bit boring. So everybody's happy when one of the hunters stands up and tells the other members of the tribe how they hunted the mighty bison in the summer, how they tracked it down and finally found it and then killed it. And now in the winter, they are nourishing, they are eating the flesh of this mighty bison. And after the warrior has stopped his story, there's a small silence. And in the silence, they hear a scratch. And then they turn their head and they see on the wall, the scratch is from one of the other hunters who painted a picture of this hunting for the bison, who took animal blood and coal and painted this story as a picture on the cave wall. And as you can see here, this story, this picture, we can still see that 16,000 years later. This is a picture from the cave of Altamira in Spain. One of the earliest pieces of human art. And of course, we're not sitting in caves anymore. We're not sitting around campfires anymore. But still, the same is true for us modern men as well. And that's what domain storytelling is also about. We still want to spark a fire, tell a story, and paint a picture. Of course, it's not a real fire anymore. It's not in a cave, it's in a meeting room, typically a canvas or a whiteboard. And the story is not told by hunters anymore. The story is told by our users. We want to write programs in the end. And um, the picture is not drawn with animal blood and coal anymore on the cave wall. It's now drawn with a marker on our modeling space here. Here you can see my colleague Stefan uh, doing a domain modeling, domain storytelling session. Stefan is not here. You will have to get along with me. And who am I? My name is Henning Schwentner. Well, that's kind of hard to pronounce broadly, so let's stay with Henning. And I work as a coder, coach, and consultant. That means when I'm lucky, I get my hands on the keyboard. But as you all know, the day rates, they, they rise when you go to the right. So that's why I have to do what I, what, what, what I'm, uh, <coughs> that's why I have to do what I'm doing with you. I stand in front of people and tell them how to do it right. Gesundheit. How to do it right with programming or how I think what it's right with programming. So that's coaching, consulting, coaching what I'm doing with you, giving talks, but also consulting, working with teams, typically on their monolithic piece of software, on the big ball of mud software, which should be transformed into modern times, into a more modular system, maybe even into microservices. And what for me as a technical person is very interesting there is that you can build microservices in every language. They're all equally well suited. Of course, this is a Java conference and that means I have to, would have to say Java is the best language for monoliths. But the truth is you can build this monolithic piece of software in C Sharp just as well. Maybe the best language is COBOL. Uh, I missed that on the slide here. I'm working for a company that's called WPS um, in Germany. We are the one with the touch table. And storytelling, I said that's 
what we are going to talk about and we talked about cavemen that's all nice and well but let's talk about a story that helps us build software let's talk about a story that we want to build software for so let's imagine bob bob wants to get rid of its old combustion engine car and wants to buy a new electrical car but bob has a problem he doesn't have any money in his pocket so well it's kind of hard he goes to his car dealer anyway and asks him the question do i get a car for this even if i don't have any money and of course he expects that this will be the answer no way but car dealers they are inventive people the car dealer sells tells him well we have a solution for your problem that solution is called leasing or car leasing that means you don't have to buy the car yourself we are going to buy it for you and then we are going to lease it to you for a monthly payment so we're not only having the car manufacturer here and the end customer there and the end customer buys the car from the car manufacturer but we're getting now a leasing company in between the leasing company buys the car from the car manufacturer and then it is sold on or rented on leased on to the end customer and i think we can all easily imagine that this leasing company has a big big ball of mud piece of software which is obviously called monolith a monolith a monolithic leasing software here okay to modernize this monolith um to modularize this modeling monolith uh, this monolith we have to understand what's happening in the domain and that's where domain storytelling comes in so let's tell the story again of leasing it starts with our customer the customer tells his wish for a car to the salesperson and the salesperson will then calculate the installment for the contract for the car you see there's a lot of domain language here installment that's the name the term for the monthly payment that the customer has to make and then the customer if they will accept the installment say well i can afford that installment then the customer will sign the contract and give it back to the salesperson and now the salesperson will pass on the contract to a risk manager and the risk manager will then check the credit rating that is the risk of the customer and they will calculate the resale value that's the risk of the car and based on this credit rating and resale value the risk manager votes the contract to vote means to say yes we want to do this contract or no the risk is too high we cannot do this contract and let's assume the risk manager votes yes votes positively then the salesperson can give the car to the customer so what you can see here that is your first domain story so you can see that's a very simple pictographic language used to draw diagrams to understand what's happening in the domain what's the domain the domain is the space of the real world that we are building software for, for or in other words that's the problem that we are going to solve with the, with our software the fancy word for that is domain okay so what did we just do now let's look at domain storytelling explained so the main storytelling is a so-called collaborative modeling method collaborative modeling is a family of methods uh, the basic idea is that we want to build the domain model the understanding of the domain we want to build that together collaboratively so we want to bring two kinds of people together and that's developers us and them domain experts or users uh, the people that have to use the software in the end and the sad truth i have to tell you here is that we have to talk to each other so 
we developers have to get in the same room with the domain experts. And since the pandemic is kind of over, we, we really have probably really have to get in the same room again, not on in the, the same Zoom call. Because what we want to do is we want to work together on the knowledge from the domain. We want to understand what's happening here in this example. We want to understand what leasing is about. And what we want to do together is crunch on that knowledge from the domain. Knowledge crunching, that's a term from DED from Domain Driven Design. The idea is we want to chew on that knowledge until the juice comes out, the essence comes out. That's what we want to do. And there are different methods um, in this collaborative modeling area. You might have heard and used user story mapping or event storming. Those are both methods with sticky notes. And now the main storytelling is another method. That's a method with stick figures and arrows. And the main storytelling is also a combination of two main ingredients. One is the pictographic language. We saw that earlier, stick figures and arrows. And the other is the workshop format. And it's fun if you combine them both. It's nice to have a pictographic language, but what brings really the use is to combine it with a workshop format. And the most important thing with this workshop is that we have the right people together, the right people in the room. Who are the right people? Of course, when you can get Chuck Norris, he's always the right people. Okay, you were supposed to laugh now. Um, okay, Chuck Norris is always the right people, but probably you won't get him because he has to save the world or and can make it, stuff like that. If Chuck Norris can't make it, who are the right people then? There's two groups that are most important. One are the storytellers, those who have knowledge about the domain, who want to share this knowledge who want to tell their story. And then there's listeners, people that want to get this knowledge, that want to hear about the domain. So storytellers, listeners. And then typically you will have a moderator slash modeler too, who draws the picture and leads the discussion. Storytellers, those are most often people from the domain and listeners those are typically people from tech developers, but it's not as black as, and, as, and white because when you bring together different people from the domain, then uh, they will tell their story also to each other. When we have people from different departments, then they will learn from each other. So you can be both in the role of a storyteller and a listener in the same session. And also when you are as a developer working in a domain, then over time you will probably gather knowledge of the domain and you can also tell part of the story. So storytelling, that's what we're using to get this information, to get this knowledge. Why is that? Um, <coughs> because storytelling is something that is deeply rooted in all of us. Even the cavemen, they knew how to tell a story, to hear a story, all of us have probably heard fairy tales like this here, Hansel and Gretel. I don't know, is that a fairy tale that you tell in Sweden as well? Yeah. Um, and of course, fairy tales, that's nice. <laughs> but when we talk about the main stories, best it would be if we he heard real stories, not fairy tales. So that's why when we talk about the right people, then it's, we want to have the people that really do the work that are using the software later. So be careful with management. Often it's good to have them there because they might have a bigger picture of what's happening. But on the other hand, we don't want to have the effect that a manager tells how it used to be 10 years ago before he got promoted or how he wishes um, the work to be done because we want to know how the work is really done because in the end we have to support with our software the work, how it is really done. And why is this communication between users on the one hand and developers on the other hand so important? Because misunderstanding is a common plague there. So 
This is software development in one picture in all its details. So this is the domain expert, the user, and his wishes, and this, this is us, the developer, and th that's what, what we built for them. And of course, we want to get rid of these misunderstandings. We want to bring our imaginations closer, more closely together. So it's also about expectations management. And since it is so easy to misunderstand each other, especially for de developers and users, we need a technique that gets rid even of the small misunderstandings. And that's why we're using this very simple form of communication, this storytelling. So there's a simple rule here. So a domain storytelling session goes like this. A storyteller, a domain expert says something like, the salesperson passes on the contract, contract to the risk manager. And then we developers, we listeners, we draw that into the diagram. We draw this sentence as a drawn sentence. So the salesperson hands over the contract to the risk manager. Very simple, right? And even in this very simple example, we have a first misunderstanding. You saw it, you're, you're, you're nodding here. So the salesperson passes on the contract, and here we have the salesperson hands over the contract. So those are the small subtleties that we have to see here. So our domain expert can say, well, no, 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 I'm not handing over the, domain, uh, the, the contract. I'm passing it on. And handing over means for me something different. And we cannot use that word here. Because we developers, we're just learning about the domain. Maybe they say, yeah, hand over is also OK. That's a synonym for pass on. Then it's OK to hand, use hand over. But typically, it's not OK. And we have to be very exact here and to understand the exact language. And we have to ex understand the exact process. So it's a form of what we also call active listening. Active listening means not listening like this here, not, 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 yes, 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 I understand what you tell me. But this is a form of active listening that means while you tell me your story, I repeat what you have told me uh, or what I have understand from what you have told me in my own words, that's called paraphrasing, or in my own diagrams, that's what we're doing here. So I show you, this is what I have understood, what you have told me. Did I understand you right? And then you can say yes, or you can say no, we have to do this different. So this is this idea of active listening, this idea of getting rid of misunderstandings. And we're using concrete stories for that and not abstract processes because we want to have um, a medium that can be easily understood for normal people that is, users. Normal people, that means um, people that are not educated in programming, that have no formal education, that do not know about if, then, else, and loops and stuff like that. That's why domain storytelling has its own pictographic language, which should be very simple. And we're not using um, BPMN or UML or other uh, notations here. That's for later. BPMN, that's and UML, those are great notations for communication between developer and developer. But here we are in communication between domain expert and developer. So that's why we need a simple notation. This thing, what is called the pictographic language. And the pictographic language um, takes these sentences that we hear and draws them into the diagram. So this is sentence one, the customer tells the wish for a card to the salesperson. This is sentence two, the salesperson calculates the installment for the contract. And this language has basically two kinds of icons and one kind of arrow, and that's it. You want it to be simple, so we don't have to explain much to our domain experts, to our users. So one kind of icon, that's the actor, the stick figures, the people that are doing stuff. And the other icons, those are the so-called work objects, the things that the actors are working on. 
and then we have the one kind of arrow that's the activity that's what the actor does with the work object that's it actor work object activity and then we have these sequence numbers up here the sequence numbers they are to bring time into the story So when we look into our example story, the risk manager, that's an actor, the contract, that's a work object, votes, that's an activity. Those are nouns, the icons, risk manager and contract, and the activity, those are verbs. That's interesting. Because verbs, that's something that we cannot see. Verbs, they express the dynamics. They express what's happening. Risk manager and contract, we can see that. That's a person, that's a thing, we can touch that. Votes, the activities, we have to learn about that by observation or by hearing that in our interview sessions. Okay, now these icons, we can vary them, of course, so for different work objects, we use different icons. The installment, that's a dollar sign here. Um, the car, that's a car sign here. Typically, it's a good idea to have not too few and not too many at different icons in one story here. And of course, we can do the same with the actors. Typically, we have a person here. Sometimes we want to put a hat on their head or uh, tie a tie around their neck when they're important. But also groups can be actors and even IT systems can be actors. So an IT system that does something can be an actor in, an, in a domain story too. And talking about these two things that we have, the actors and the work objects, um, there's one thing that um, at first looks strange, but when you get used to it, makes sense. And that is that we have the customers once, uh, the actors once, like the customer here. Every actor will be once in a picture. And the work objects, they typically appear several times. So in step four, the customer fills out the contract and in step five, the customer signs the contract and you see this icon is again here. Although it's the same contract, we have it again and again. I will show you later why this makes sense. Okay, and then there's some last um, part of this domain language or this pictographic language and that's the canvas. That's the piece of paper or whiteboard or whatever we draw the story on. We can do that in a digital way or in an analog way. Typically, it's a good idea to have a big wide space where we want to model and then we put the name of the domain story on top and we have some space for annotations. Okay, so now we've seen what's part of the pictographic language, actors, work objects, activities, sequence numbers and canvas. And what you might also notice is what's not part of the language and that is conditionals. We don't have if else here and we don't have switch case, we don't have or and that's by design, that's deliberately. And why is that? Um, as I said earlier, we want to have pictures, we want to have diagrams that are easy to understand by users, by people that have no formal education and this conditional thing well, that's something that's natural for programmers, but not for non-programmers. So if we want to model different cases, we have to use something else. And when we don't have if else. And what are we using here? Um, we are using what's called scenario-based modeling. And that means every domain story is one story, is one scenario. And when we want to look at different cases, that's another scenario. So we typically start with the good case, everything went, goes, goes well, and then we model um, special cases in another picture, in another domain story. So every picture can be small, can be easily understood. On the other hand, that means we typically have several stories. 
So here in this example, we start with the good case, with the 80% case, leasing a car, and then we move on and say, okay, well, what happens if the risk manager says, well, the risk is too high, we don't want to do this contract. That's another story, we model that in another picture. That's, of course, something that's very different from, for example, BPMN, where we have gateways and put um, different cases in, in one model. Okay, having said that, um, I would like to go with you into a little exercise. Um, I hope it's not too early for that. And I'm going to be the moderator and you are going to be my storytellers. So that's why we need a story that we all know about. And um, that's why we use this story here, travel by train. I think we all know how this is, that is going. Probably many of you have arrived by train here today or yesterday. And let's look into that story. And I'm going to switch the screen. Um, I'm going to use an online tool here that can be used for domain storytelling. Um, since we don't have a whiteboard here, which could be used otherwise. Okay, and I start with writing the name of the story, and that is Travel by Train. Okay, how is that working? <laughs> you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you you want to be in the in the part of the of the listener. Who knows how to travel by train? Just um, shout it into the room. Oh, um, I hear we, we we take the ticket. Okay. Okay, so I see we have a ticket here, and that ticket is bought. And who are we um, in this story? Who that, that are buying the tickets. Traveler, okay. So we have a traveler here, and that traveler buys a ticket. A timetable. Yeah, w what about it? Aha, uh -huh. okay, so I understand you, you look at the timetable to find out which um, train you want to take. Okay. We also have to know w where to go, yeah. Okay, what's <laughs> very good. Um, <laughs> um, wh wh what is that called, this thing wh where we want to go? Destination. Destination, awesome. Um, uh, no, I don't have a real destination I can hear. Okay, so I heard we have this timetable and we have the destination and um, then you said um, there was a train, I think. So wh what, is the, is the, the, what is it that we're doing with the timetable to you said you we we search for a train in the t uh, in the timetable or what is the word select train uh, to destination i think ah okay so we, we need a destination and we also need a place to start, okay. Origin, okay. So, okay. Um, not sure if I got this right. So we have this um, select train from 
origin to destination from the timetable. Okay. And does this happen before or after buying the ticket? Before. Okay, so th then this should be step one, right? Okay, so now the traveler um, has selected a train from the origin to the destination from the timetable and then buys a ticket. Probably, I assume, a ticket for that train, right? That we just found out. Aha. Aha. Ah, another word that we're getting here. So, is train the right word? Here you're saying, uh, if I understand you right, you're saying what we really want to select is a route here. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so th there's the route and the time here. Okay, is, is route then the, s the right word or is there another word? Itinerary, okay. Sorry, departure is also a word here. Okay, we see. Well, it, it gets complicated, right? Um, I think another word that I have heard here is connection. So, okay, so um, let's stick to one of the words here. Um, um, no. Nah. Um, who, who's a native speaker in English here? You are, okay, so so what what would be the <laughs> the best word? Like this, right? I T I I T. Oh my God, I, I can't do it if you're looking. <laughs> <laughs> Itinerary. Okay. Oh my God. And I I itinerary is the right pronunciation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you will hear I'm not from England, right? <laughs> okay. So and we've seen here, and um, there are other words as well. So um, I'm writing down a note here. Um, think about. Um, departure, connection, and we're going to do that later because we don't have the time now. Okay, so the traveler selects the itinerary from origin to destination from the timetable. Ah, and um, part of that is the time. Um, and then the traveler buys a ticket for that um, itinerary and then what? What happens next? Okay. Um, I add a note here, variant, um, seat selection. Um, sorry? Yeah, the number of tickets can also be a, a, a variant. Um, I write that down. And we stay here for the sake of the exercise. We stay in the simple case. So we're not going um, to do seat selection now and we're, o we're having only one ticket. Um, and thank you that you're mentioning that. It's important. And you can see here, that's what we want to hear, variants. And we write them down and then we move on with our first simple case. Okay, so what happens next after buying the ticket? Okay. Boarding of the train. So the, the traveler boards the train, right? Okay. And then what? The, the, the traveler goes to the destination? The train goes to, okay. Who, 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 who makes the train go to the destination? Magic. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and we are laughing about that, but of course that's um, that's very real life. <laughs> this uh, the energy well that just comes out of the wall when I plug in um, my electrical devices. Um, same with money. Yeah, <laughs> it just happens to be <laughs> on my bank account, right? Um, anybody with real domain knowledge here who who makes the the train uh, go to the, the destination? Operator? So there's a person. And, and what does the operator do with the train? Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Drives, yeah. I think he also operates it, but um, here maybe driving is a, is a more special form of operating here. So the, the, the operator drives the train to the destination with the traveler. Let's hope that. And then? Aha. Uh -huh. Somebody wants to see the ticket. And who's that? That's somebody? The conductor. Conductor. <laughs> so the conductor, um, wh what do they do with the ticket? Sorry? Validate. Okay. So the conductor validates the ticket of the traveler. Okay. And then what? Sorry? Okay, so for the people in the back, um, the, the point was, well, they are not validating the ticket anymore. They come around with a device and, s and scan your ticket. And then there was um, another opinion said, well, that is the validation. So maybe I put a note here, um, can be done um, with a device to right? this validation of the ticket. OK, and then what happens next? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we, d we definitely should uh, draw a boundary here, um, and I would say, for the short time that we have here, let's put the cleaning out of of out of that boundary, out of scope. Um, and th then I asked the the question the other way around. So. That means we're done here? Is that the whole story for for only the, the travel of the train? Disembark? Okay, so the traveler um, disembarks, I assume, at the destination, right? Ah, okay, so like this here, right? Um, traveler disembarks and for, before that, um, operator drives train to destination and then traveler disembarks train. Like this? Sorry? On platform. Ah. We're getting more and more domain knowledge and domain words here. Boarding also on a platform. Okay. Now we see we go more into the details here. Um, let's not 
do that too much now. Let's stay on a coarse grained level. Um, and on a coarse grained level, is this it? Okay, so that means this this step here has to be step number four. Is that what you're saying? Okay, good point with the parallel. Um, we make a note for that. I'm going to talk about that later, about this parallel. You see, now I'm putting it in uh, in, in, in sequence. I will tell you later why I did that. Okay, then let's do a replay here. So we have the traveler who selects an itinerary with time uh, from origin to destination from the timetable. Then the traveler buys the ticket for the itinerary the traveler boards the train um, on a platform. The conductor validates the ticket of the traveler. The operator drives the train to the destination and the traveler disembarks the train on the platform. Right? Is that it on a coarse grain level? Ah, go to another platform and take another train. Um, I would say that is another story, um, and I think that's an interesting story. So I put a note on here and say um, variant uh, switch to another train. But um, here for the simple case, I think we're done, right? Uh, sorry? Yeah, um, I, I heard um, since the operator drives the train to the destination, then the traveler disembarks the train uh, on the platform. Sorry, this got lost. Variant switching of a train. Okay, so now we did a first domain story and we already heard there's variants that we want to look at here, switching of the train. Um, also, we saw here seat selection, buying more than one ticket. So um, when you use this tool, then typically you open up um, a new tab here and say, OK, let's now model the next story, switching off the trains. Of course, we don't have the time for that now. So I'm going uh, back to the slides. And we have uh, no. This is not what I want to do. Um, Here we go. Oh, sorry. So we have five more minutes left. So I'm telling you something about the scope factors um, that we can use there. So. Um, I showed you <coughs> we are using different domain stories typically um, to model different cases, but also to model um, different scopes. Um, we say the scope of a domain story is made of three factors, the granularity, the point in time, and the domain purity. Granularity means are we modeling um, on the bird's eye perspective, coarse grained, or are we modeling the details? fine-grained. Point in time means are we modeling the as-is, the process as it is now, or are we modeling as the process will be after we have introduced a new system or after a new legal requirement is in place or after we have optimized the process. That's point in time. And then we have the domain purity. Are we modeling the pure domain process, the paper process? Or are we modeling the process together with IT? And um, all these different factors can be interesting and we can combine them, of course. Um, and th that makes sense for different purposes that we have here. Okay. Um, then 
There are different tools that we can use for domain storytelling. PowerPoint, well, is not well suited only here for giving talks, not for the workshop situation. There is Egan.io, that's the tool that I was using earlier. Um, Egan.io it's called, but you don't need a, a digital tool. You can also use just a whiteboard here. And what I also like to use is this. Um, when you have a projector, then you can use um, a tablet with a, with a pencil. That's also nice. Okay, and then now that we did this modeling with the main stories, okay, now what, what are we doing with that? Um, we can use that for different purposes. Um, and of course, we don't have much time left to talk about that, but I'm giving you a short idea of the different purposes that we can use it for. So one thing is to learn the domain language. We did that in our session as well. We um, heard different words from different people and we came to a common understanding. That's good. Um, we can use it to derive requirements like user stories. So for example, in our um, leasing story, we can say, well, this the customer tells a wish for a car to the salesperson. This can then lead to a user story, which is called tell wish for a car. And the next step, calculate installment for contract, can come into a story, calculate installment. And we can even combine that with user story mapping if you're into that. Also, we can use domain stories to come to code to derive a domain model. So there's a basic rule of thumb, and that means take the work objects and make classes out of them, take the activities and make methods out of those. So uh, I have to jump for that. Um, so when we look into our story, what is an important work object? Obviously the contract. So let's make a class contract out of that. And what are activities that are done with this? Um, we sign a contract, we, we vote a contract, and that will become methods on our class. And what we get then, that's what's called a domain model with rich behavior, rich domain behavior. Okay, another purpose we don't have to look the time on is we can use domain stories for strategic design. That means we can use it for splitting the monolith. But I'm coming to the end now. And um, what's the conclusion? Um, if you're interested in this kind of modeling, then uh, further reading can be found here, domainstorytelling.org. Um, that's the official website. Um, this is the official book that the Stefan I showed you earlier and I have written. So get your cameras out now and, <laughs> and, and buy the book here. Um, and with that, the end is near. Um, if you like to have swag, um, I brought some stickers here for your laptops or anything. Grab your copy. And with that, um, oh, with that, I have to say thank you. But also, um, please evaluate the session. I have the understanding that there is an app. Um, so please install the JFocus app and uh, press on the great button. And um, with that, I say thank you. Happy end. Um, that's it. Thank you. And I, I will be here for questions um, if there are some. <laughs>